You're listening to Leading Up with Udemy. This podcast is your guide to developing your skills as an emerging or seasoned leader. I'm Alan Todd, your host and the Vice President of Leadership Development at Udemy. Together, we can work, lead, and live differently to create a better world. I had the great pleasure of sitting down with Colonel Adam Pannone, a West Point grad, a military officer, and a learning leader at Johnson & Johnson. The concept from the military is they practice everything like a simulation. So they're simulating battle, they simulate fighting, they simulate supply chain. So everything is about low stakes practice so that when you get to high stakes engagement, you've practiced everything to automaticity. It just happens like second nature. And I think the idea that we bring that, if we can have low stakes practice at work, we can achieve more fluency. And if you apply that to your career, you can apply low stakes practice to everything in team meetings, presentations, problem solving in low stakes to prepare you and build those skills and hone them for a career of success in bigger things. Too often organizations don't have the low stake opportunity to let people practice in a way where they get their first people leading opportunity and they're in charge of these multi-million dollar accounts with all these people looking up to them and they're really put into a pressure cooker and they haven't had that opportunity. That's the thing that I wish I could port most from that experience. And I try to bring the best elements of that experience to the teams, cultures, and climates that I'm a part of. This week on Leading Up, we're talking to a leader who walks the walk and talks the talk. Adam Pannone leads digital upskilling initiatives at Johnson & Johnson. Before that, he developed leaders from new hires to the C-suite while working for management consulting greats PwC and Booz Allen. His leadership foundation was forged at West Point and honed over years of service in the military intelligence community. The Army Reserve named him Instructor of the Year in 2018. Adam, welcome to the podcast. Alan, thank you. What an awesome introduction. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. So let's start. Would you just tell us about West Point? What did you learn? What did they teach you? You definitely learn a lot. You're going to learn a lot of things that you totally signed up for and you expected to learn while going there. You're going to learn a whole bunch of things you probably didn't expect either. The immersion there is is pretty incredible. And it hits students at a very early stage in their lives and careers, right? These are usually 18 to 20 year olds, pretty early to go that deep and that intense. And so you learn a lot of things, discipline, right? Whether you like it or not, like that's pretty tough for like a lot of young people to get that level of discipline. You're going to learn a lot about values. Something that I can't say enough about is for is like the moral ethical values. You're, You're expected to do some pretty dangerous things in the career that you're kind of following And West Point does a really great job of trying to make sure right and wrong is really a part of all of that decision making. And the thing that I like to think most about is it is an ultimate testing ground to live and practice the very things that you're talking about. So when you talk about leadership, you are living in a hierarchical organization that you get to practice the very things you talk about every single day. A lot of trial and error, a lot of good examples, a lot of bad examples, all of which you can turn around, reflect on, and then repractice immediately. What's the difference for those that work in the private sector or even the public sector, but non-military? Is it the same? Is it different? Do they need to be different? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a pretty unrealistic expectation. That you're like, well, we're just going to send everybody to West Point, right? Like, that's just not a thing that most, that a lot of people are going to sign up for. It's just not practical. But there's a lot of things you can take away and bring into your own organization. And the thing that I think about most that I wish that I could recreate, and a lot of organizations do try to do this as, as best they can, is creating an opportunity of practice that is low stakes practice. This is as much practice as you can get for the most people most often in a way that allows them to work on their craft, to work on the things that work for them, that have good results and it feels right for them. It's this authentic style and they're executing it and they're able to kind of figure out where it does and doesn't work. And I just feel like too often organizations don't have the low stake opportunity to let people practice in a way where 
you know, they get their first people leading opportunity and they're in charge of these multi-million dollar accounts with all these people looking up to them. And they're really put into a pressure cooker and they haven't had that opportunity. And so like, that's the thing that I wish I could port most from that experience. And I try to bring the best elements of that experience to the teams, cultures, and climates that I'm a part of. One of the things I've read about with West Point is like, we're only in the business of developing leaders. Like you're going to get leadership development 24 seven. It's what we do a hundred percent of the time. And obviously in business, you're you're doing something else. So how do people practice leadership behaviors at work? Do you implement programs to get people to do that? Or do you try and weave it into everything you do? You kind of brought up perfectly. There's a lot of leaders in positions that are program leads and they're leading accounts and they have meetings with clients. That professional leadership practice maybe isn't in their top three priorities. Maybe they don't have time for it in a way that they want. But I do want people that want to do that. They want that responsibility to help shape and grow and develop teams. And it's in all of that. It's everyone's best interest, right? But it doesn't always get the priority that it deserves. And so I guess I would say for for people in these positions, I want them to really feel a responsibility and ownership for being a good leader. Be the leader that you've always wanted in your career. Like You have to try to be that person. You can't want it just for a title or a pay raise or some sort of promotion, like you want to be, you need to want to be good at this craft. And I find that those kinds of leaders tend to do the best because it's hard. Like that's like another thing that like no one really tells you up front, but this is a pretty tough road. You're going to deal with all kinds of stuff and you definitely want someone that wants to be there and be good at that part of their craft. How did you develop your sense of identity as a leader? I would say... Everybody has a specialty in in the army, right? So I am an intelligence specialist. But if I described how I became the leader and, and kind of the things that I emulate myself, I would say I'm a professional generalist. And that is something that I don't know that I fully understood until I read David Epstein's Range. That book really put structure and understanding to something that I maybe always felt but didn't really realize. And it really talks about the value of broad and diverse experiences. That kind of shaped me as a leader and that I'm then now looking for those differentiated experiences that I maybe wasn't looking for originally. And I would say that shaped a lot about how I lead and how I think about leading today. So you had to discover that the hard way because David Epstein's book, Range, great book, but it didn't come out until a couple of years ago. So as you think about this, he essentially argues the opposite of what everybody's been told forever, right? You pick a sport and then you drop everything and do it year round and get coaching and you have to do everything. And I think there's something rich there that you discovered long before that book came out. And I'm wondering for someone that's listening and they're thinking, you know, do I focus and narrow down my career or do I sort of expand horizontally and build some other types of skills that kind of mesh together into something that maybe is more interesting and fits together and ultimately becomes more valuable. So you kind of did it. How did you figure that out? And what were you bucking the trend or did you feel bad when you're like, I'm not perfect to go deep in any of these things? Did that start to give you a crisis of confidence? So I think you hit the nail on the head as far as trial by accident or fire, right? Because I remember being pretty self-conscious about it because there are plans, right? There are career progression plans that that are kind of laid out for people and, and it kind of narrows the menu. But one of the things that Range kind of quotes really well is that these really highly credentialed experts can often become extremely narrow-minded and maybe that experience makes them a little bit worse than they might otherwise be. And so what I kind of discovered is that they they kept promoting me quickly in the military because like I didn't do a lot of the things they might have said, but they were getting the kind of results they wanted. They want these think on your feet integrative leaders and that just kind of happened and it took me like a long time to realize like, why was that happening. It's like is Adam some sort of innovative, like, blah, blah, blah? No, it's just these broad, diverse experiences gave me a lot of different ways to look at problems. So for like early career folks, I want them to understand that 
you don't have to find the path and align to it as hard as some might tell you. And that the ability to creatively think and integrate broadly from all of your different experiences is super, super valuable. And that you shouldn't feel like you're off path, you are on your own unique path. And for leaders trying to build those kinds of folks and that they want more creative and more innovative people that are able to work cross-functionally in their organizations, I want them to have a broad menu. I want them to be able to demonstrate to these young and up-and-coming leaders there's lots of different options for them and that there isn't a perfect path and that I want them to value the variability in some of these different opportunities and that it's good for the organization and it's good for developing the kinds of leaders we need to solve what's left, which is mostly challenging, sticky problems. The research is clear that people that develop curiosity and look at a lot of different things and learn a lot of different tangential things end up being more innovative and bring more innovation than single, focused, narrow, deep, disciplined people. You mentioned curiosity, and I I would like to talk a little bit about that because it's such an awesome word and an even better practice. But it's really kind of finding that balance between efficiency and exploration. And I learned that I happen to be an explorer, that the journey has tremendous value, and that I like to build experiences, I like to build resourcing and kind of work with people that are really also into that exploration, that are kind of trying to look for some things, that are trying to solve a particular problem, but they're not necessarily looking for point A to point B. And I I do try to seek out the value and the exploration of just being a lifelong learner. That's something that we're working on at Johnson & Johnson Learn. It's things that other organizations that I've worked with are also looking for, and that changes over time. But the fact that I have a deep passion for that space has been really good for me in my career and kind of That's the direction I ended up wanting to lead in. I want to be a leader in this space and I'm having a great opportunity to do that now. Yeah, it's great that you underscored curiosity. And Satya Nadella, when he took over as the CEO at Microsoft, he said, I want us all to become learn-it-alls, not know-it-alls. And I thought that was a really nice way to put it. He felt the company had a little too much hubris and... And he flipped that, and now you're describing that as what has fueled your career. Yeah, and I think there's a lot that people can take away from a very simple but very deep word. And you hear curiosity, but a lot of people that I, like, well, how do, how do you do that, right? Like, is that just some sort of innate thing in being in, like, you know, the, the learning profession? Like, it, no, it's a skill, right? Like, I, I think it's a skill. And and you kind of have to believe that people are, are good at certain different things, but so many things can be broken down into skills that can be acquired if you want them. And when I have meetings and conversations and I'm consulting on, on how to maybe help within different cultures and make that lifelong learner culture a part of teams that are really driving to be innovative, there's just kind of a couple of things that come to mind of like, what does this mean, right? So if you are on your way to engage in your work and you're like, man, what? how do I do this today? Like, how do I do this right now? And there's a couple kind of things that I like to say, this is obviously a generalization, but especially seasoned leaders or people that are in charge of teams, how often are you initiating pilots? How often do you talk about proof of concepts? And how are you supporting diverse interest? So all of those things are tangible activities and kind of thought processes for teams that demonstrate I value curiosity, right? That I value that we're going to go and try a thing and we are going to explore a little bit. And I I just want team leaders to really embrace and understand the power of exploration and that I don't want that to be squeezed out, especially when times are tough and projects really demand some sort of immediate, obviously demonstrable performance result or metric. But I just really good innovative teams make some space for the kind of innovation that is that curiosity and that's trying stuff out and having proof proofs of pilots and if you're an early career professional and you're aspiring to be this person who doesn't have the authority to create proof of concepts or pilots just yet your curious playbook comes in a lot of questioning and it's trying to avoid that 
trapping that powerful allure of, I need to appear perfect and I need to be out here and knowing everything and that's how I get ahead. And so for those folks, I always want you to be like, well, well why? Or, or how, did, how did you come up with that conclusion? These, these curious questions where you're seeking out information and you're having dialogue and you're not working so hard to provide the fastest solution to a problem because you feel like that's what you need to do to demonstrate your value to the organization. So if you're a team leader, it's pilots and proofs of concept and valuing diverse interests. And if you're an aspiring leader, it sounds like it's curiosity is asking questions, but more importantly, having the courage to admit you don't know everything and try to not show up perfect, but maybe ask the big dumb questions. Those might be some easy first steps for people that hear the word curiosity and say, well, I want to do this. What do I do first? Right. You know, if you're a team leader, I I want you asking questions, too. I want you to not feel like because you're the leader, you have to have all these answers. And kind of coming back to what we talked about in the beginning about like owning that leadership experience is that you, you have to demonstrate that people are always watching you. And so if you aren't demonstrating the kind of actions that lead to a curious culture, then you might be shutting people down. If people have these off the wall ideas and you're just like, oh my God, I'll I'll never get a a business metric that proves that this was a good idea. You might lose out on some things. And that's where like, like having people with range and these diverse experiences on your team can kind of bring these kind of crazy off the wall perspectives and ideas. But that's what we're looking for. We're looking for these new and innovative ideas. And so I just, that is a way in which curiosity can really be put into action for the kind of innovative and creative teams we're looking for. All right, I want to switch gears and talk about accountability. Oh, man. So here's my story. I had a Wharton professor named Chuck Dwyer, who I loved. He taught from this school of philosophy that basically went like this. He'd say, they didn't listen. You weren't interesting enough. They didn't understand. You weren't clear enough. They didn't buy in. You weren't persuasive enough. His message was basically, you own this. Stop blaming your kids for not listening or your boss for not believing in you. You have no control over their behavior and you have 100% control over your own. So change your behavior, start with yourself and take 100% of the blame for your failure or lack of progress. And I feel like it's tough medicine, but I know you have strong feelings and opinions and thoughts on this, and you've taught it and thought about it from military, private sector. So talk about accountability from your perspective. Yeah, this is a tough ego check for everyone, myself included. I, I can't think of anyone that I wouldn't include and blame cascades so poorly in teams and organizations that I I just can't like underline that enough that if you as a leader are blaming, then people on your team are then, well, now it's okay to blame. We're doing that now. And so if you are emulating that kind of behavior, which is often, you know, a transfer of accountability away from yourself, that is just, it is so poorly received throughout the organization, and you're going to get back what you give out, right? And so now when you go to a subordinate who had a project and it didn't quite go that way, well, now they're blaming somebody else, right? To be behavior emulated on that team culture is one of a lack of accountability. And so I always want the most ownership possible from leading. And you, you might feel like, you know, Adam, you, you don't work in the business. Well, I, I did work in the business and and I like to work and help the business leaders in this regard in that helping them take ownership of their teams. And especially when it comes to like team development, I really, really want that team members. They want personalization. They want things to be really custom and kind of perfect for them. And, and, you know, J and J, that's something that we strive for, but personalization is not a lack of accountability for those leaders, right? Like you are still accountable for developing your teams. And so I, I want that to be a part of them owning their responsibility and kind of embracing it. Like we said, it was hard. That's okay. We'll figure it out. And 
you are now not passing blame. You're taking full ownership and you are emulating those good behaviors that we, like we said earlier can be extremely contagious. And like I said, people always know. They never not notice. And so if you think that like maybe they won't notice, I would say that in most instances, you're probably incorrect. Yeah. So why is this such an issue? Are there people that just deflect accountability? Is this just society writ large? Is this in every company? And what's the root cause? Oof. I don't think so. I don't think it's society writ large. I think you might say that like the me culture has maybe picked up in some regards, but I don't know that this is like a a new problem. I I think it has a lot to do with kind of like just team orientation and generally making sure that you've got a clear vision and purpose for your team and that people are trying to solve this collective problem and that people are incentivized and rewarded in a way to solve collective problems instead of making sure like like the military, I, I think we used to call like a spotlight ranger. Like, well, what is a spotlight ranger? It's someone who steps into the limelight when things are going right and then very deftly finds a way to step out of the limelight when things are going wrong. And we just got to make sure that those kinds of behaviors are unacceptable and are not rewarded or emulated. And that when people are achieving these collective tasks, they're rewarded for that. And you want leaders that are able to do that on their teams. And I think that it's just something you can forget or get lost. It's not baked in to that way, but like th- they are behaviors that if left unchecked, if you do not hold people accountable for, hey man, you can't just step out of the limelight and not be in charge when things don't go right. That's a thing that the organizations are kind of enforcing or de-enforcing based on, on how they do their rewards and, and how they kind of promote folks, right? So you just make sure that you're taking those good leadership behaviors and you're rewarding them and putting people that do that well in a position to have increased influence. And so is it a lack of courage when people don't take ownership because they don't want to feel stupid or be seen as a failure? Is it a courage failure? Is it a character flaw? (laughs) What uh, I'm trying to get to some understanding of what causes the lack of accountability. I guess I would say as I'm thinking about it now, it's just everybody aspires to to do their best. Um, and and if a culture maybe doesn't quite have that fail mentality, like it's okay, like pilots and proofs of concepts. If you don't have a built-in way in which you're going to try something out, it didn't work out, and then we're going to come back and double up, people are kind of super sensitive to, I can't let anyone see me fail. And so I have to step out of the limelight if I think that's going to happen because my career development and my existence at this organization depends on only positive spotlight opportunities. And so I think that organizations and teams can kind of shape how people behave in that kind of culture based on that. And I would say that most people's response to those environments are often very kind of predictable. And so you just got to make it okay for them to come in, own mistakes, and then fix those mistakes, get some reskilling, and then come back better. And I don't know that everybody gets that opportunity. So I think they just kind of have to behave in a way that feels like it's in their own best interest at the time, but maybe over medium and long term actually has negative consequences on their team's ability to meet that collective goal we said we wanted them to meet anyway. So don't just spotlight every positive thing. Maybe there's this concept, noble failures, right? Spotlight the noble failures. Is that a good thing? I like it. And then say, what did we learn from this, right? Like, like I think the military is really good at their after action reviews and making sure that we learn from our activities. Different teams do it better. I think the tech sector got a lot of notoriety for being really good at fail fast, right? Those kinds of things. Yeah. And I think that those are leadership skills and behaviors that team leads can demonstrate. And especially young career, right? Like you're, you're trying to figure this stuff out. We talked about low stakes practice for more people more often. Well, failure is all a part of that. And so I just, it just makes you just a better. You, you, you maybe even a better risk taker, but you're really growing and learning. And that's kind of what it's all about. Where's the line drawn of accountability when you're in leadership development and developing people? And let's say you run through programs. It could be online, could be in person, could be any various things. What do you own and what does that participant own 
Like, do you ever think about where the line is drawn for whether you're doing a good job, if they're successful or whether they're motivated? And how do we think about that? And that's really good. So like the kind of the push pull dynamic for how learners engage with kind of the resources that you bring to them. It was a little bit easier. I, I remember when I was an instructor at U.S. Command and General Staff College, I kind of used to liken myself to a trampoline. And so like if you jump really hard, I will shoot you up as high as I could do. Right. Like as if, if you are really invested, I'm really invested. And if you're kind of not and you just do like a little half hearted jump on the trampoline, well, you're not going to fly as high. And so I always want to spend as much time and energy on the people that are jumping as hard as possible, and I will springboard and launch them as hard as possible. So that maybe is my preferred, but I also think it's everybody's preferred. Like everyone loves working with people that are fully invested and energized. And I think when it comes to accountability, it's making sure that you are able to provide opportunity to as many people as possible in a fairly equal way. Like one of the things... Johnson & Johnson Learn is, is, I think, really amazing at is our personalized and democratized learning. So if you want to learn, you can learn. Like we, we have what's available to you and there aren't barriers for you getting the skills that you want. And what we've seen is we've seen when people push, we push back and they're super happy. And that in and of itself is a little bit contagious. Hey, they tell their coworker, did you know we have this available? You should do it too. Or why don't you be my buddy? Let's go to this event together and then we can talk about it together and then we can take it back to the business and have real nice impact. And I, I want leaders to know that making the time and space for that kind of thing is in their purview and that they are responsible for making that happen because in the end, they're developing their teams that then come to problems and are able and more capable to bring skills to bear to solve the problems that team leaders are responsible for solving. And so I want them to be fully accountable to that. It's personalized to their teams, but I want them to feel that they have to create the environment for those people to get the best spring or pushback that they can from the time and energy they spend on their upskilling and development. So I'm kind of curious. I like the trampoline metaphor. You won a teaching award in the Army Reserves, and there's lots of great research about great leaders teach right? They teach strategy. They teach the purpose, the vision. They teach. And you have taken the art of teaching to an extreme positive level. I'm wondering, what did you learn from that? What made you a great teacher? Why did you win that award? There's a quote that I will never forget. It's the kind of thing that goes on a coffee mug. Like eventually I haven't gotten around to it. But this, this quote I had, you know, we're teaching military tactics. This is mid-level majors and colonels in the U.S. Army that we're teaching. And we had this super bright student. She was a nurse. So when we are talking about large formations of tanks, that's not necessarily something that she deals with every day working in a hospital as a nurse. And so one of the courses that our students have to do is history. And she was so good. She was so good at history. And she really was making connections and understanding how to take these historical lessons and apply it to modern day problems. And I said to her, you know, you must like history. You are doing so well. And she said to me, she says, Colonel Pannone, I actually don't like history at all, but you do. And that I will never forget that the energy and the passion that I was putting into my craft was received by someone that maybe you wouldn't think would be into history from a military perspective because it doesn't immediately impact your job. And I will never forget that. And I have tried to bring that as early and often to my other roles as possible because you can bring passion to something and help people make and connect the dots. And what really we're trying to do is make them more integrative thinkers, right? How do we take these pieces and make a new whole and you can bring energy and passion as a leader to these things and you can help people be interested and see value in things that maybe they didn't see without you. And if that isn't a calling for a leader, I, I, I don't know what is. Wow. Colonel <laughs> Pannone, I love that story. Teach, coach, and motivate with your infectious enthusiasm. That's how I summarize what you just said. Beautiful. That'll fit on a coffee mug a little easier. Thank you. <laughs> Teach, coach, and motivate. Well, <laughs> Great leaders teach. And I knew we'd have a lesson from you. And by the way, that applies to 
anyone at any stage of life, at any level in an organization, everything you just said there about infectious enthusiasm. Everyone can do it. Everyone possesses the ability. Everyone possesses the potential. All right, as we wrap up, Adam, we have a question that we ask all of our guests. This can be personal, professional, life, whatever you like, but what are you curious about and learning now? So there's two things that I am aggressively pursuing is one in my role as a digital and tech kind of leader at j and I'm, I'm really into cloud right now. So I'm really making sure that when I talk about cloud technologies, I am better than I was last year. So I'm super into cloud. So you could ask me all about that. And as the weather is now increasing, I'm super into being better on a paddleboard. Alan, this year, I am going to fall in the water way less than I did last year. So a little bit of mind, a little bit of body. Those are, those are the things that I am learning and practicing this year. A little bit of mind, a little bit of body, and a lot of range, Adam. Range. Absolutely. Generalist. We're huge fans of range. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Alan, you're the best. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. Follow Leading Up, a podcast from Udemy Business, wherever you find your podcasts. Listen to new episodes every Wednesday. Did you learn something new this episode? If you did, and I hope you did, consider telling a friend about the show or sharing the show on LinkedIn. We want to inspire as many leaders as we can. To learn more about Leading Up or how Udemy can help you develop leaders at scale and move business forward, visit business.udemy.com. The Leading Up podcast is produced by Udemy in partnership with Pod People. Special thanks to our production team, Alex Vickmanis, Amy Machado, Brian Rivers, Danielle Roth, and Carter Wogan. Our original theme is by Soundboard.